Hi, welcome to the session of Enriching Cross-Cultural Intelligence. It's nice to see some familiar faces, um, familiar names, should I say. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in this session. Uh, I've been very, very excited about this session since we started planning. Um, I'm sure that it will be very, very useful for all of us. So first I want to share about um, you know, why I am passionate about cross-cultural intelligence. So being an international student myself, um, my name is Belle. I'm the National Women's Officer of CESA. And I've been an international student here in Australia for a couple of years. And because of that, I'm very aware of the cultural differences that I have compared to the Australian culture. And since working at CESA, uh, we work with a lot of international students. Uh, I've also learned a lot about the differences between different students from different countries and the cultures and learning about the ways that we can communicate and serve these students best. So I am very proud to have our speakers today to um, unpack this topic uh, for us today. And you know, cross-cultural um, competence, uh, competency is not something that's only applicable to people from diverse culture or to international students. As we move in towards this fast, rapidly changing world, we know that um, we are looking more into um, innovation and also collaboration. And this skill um, is very important for everyone um, in the multicultural and globalized world. And so there are a couple of things that it is important for us to learn with that comes with cross-cultural competency that includes uh, putting ourselves in a perspective of other people in the same team, understand the different values, beliefs and assumptions that are at play for all of us. How do we communicate their point of view um, effectively and also working towards integration different, uh, integrating different perspectives. So I would like to introduce to you um, our speakers today. Um, so the first speaker that we have is a, a very important and great mentor of mine, Div Pillay. Div is uh, the CEO of Mind Tribes, and she has a very long and impressive CV, including Div is named as one of the 100 Women of Influence by the AFR and Qantas. And also she uh, was a state judge for the Telstra Business Women's Award. So, but I would like to like you to hear from Deep herself. Deep, welcome. Thanks, Bill. Um, and wonderful to have, um, I think we've got 38 participants, which is, which is great to see. Um, so good afternoon to all of you. And I am really happy uh, to participate in your summit uh, and especially in this session because cultural diversity and cultural intelligence um, has been one of uh, my main strengths in my leadership roles. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, so many of you are interested in this topic. Um, and Bell's very, very right in saying that there's different uh, nuances to cultural intelligence. One is the, the obvious cultural difference between people that come from the East and then people that come from the West. And then there's also a rich diversity within our own cultures as well. And I'd love to cover that off with you today uh, to share a little bit of that nuance because within all of us, it's um, our own unique diversity, which comes from a mix from our cultural heritages, our lived experiences, our working experiences and interacting with each other. Um, so for me, it's been one of my, um, the cornerstones of my strength in, in my leadership journey. And I use it as part of my identity. And I must say for, for 10 years of being a migrant here, um, I came in 2002, very pregnant, an honors um, student and married and everything was new. And um, I 
just try to be very Australian, I must say. <laughs> I tried to just embrace everything that was Australia and I forgot a little bit about my own cultural heritage and my difference. And, um, you know, past that stage into working uh, career and life, I've, I've really rediscovered it. And I'd like to present you with a different view of cultural diversity and cultural competence. Um, which comes very much from my lived experience, but also from backed by evidence. So I'd love to share that with you. So thanks, Bill, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to participating. Thank you, Dee. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker. Um, I hope that Mecca is able to Great, great. Okay. We had a little bit of technical difficulties because of the firewall um, at Mecca's work, which I will describe very shortly. Thanks, Belle. And uh, uh, my apologies for joining late. Uh, I, um, as per the profile, etc., I work with the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, and we too have certain restrictions in terms of the firewalls and access to some of the new technologies that we are using quite frequently in, in our world today. So that, that just sort of created a little bit of an issue. And so I have to join via phone. So if you see my image, not as what others images are coming across. Uh, so my apologies for that. But yes, I echo Div's um, comments that she's made in terms of my appreciation for Bell and Cesa to invite me to share my experience and um, you know, my story of being an international student and what I've learned so far in terms of what cultural intelligence means, how it can be applied, where it can be applied as well. So I look forward to the session and I'm pretty sure what is going to be a very enriching conversation. So thank you for the invite. Thank you so much, Mika. We are so happy to have you here. And what's special about our speakers today is that they have been in our shoes as international students uh, when they first come to Australia, but they have gone on to accomplish so much for themselves, but also the community and for us international students. So now I would like to hand it over to Deep again for a presentation. Beautiful, thanks, Bill. And just bear with me as I share my screen. And hopefully you don't see my very, very messy um, desktop. <laughs> um, hang on a minute. It's not allowing me access to my own desktop, but I'm seeing just yours, um, Bill. So I wonder if um, Rafaela can bring it up. Is that possible? Oh, hang on. I've just been able to fix it. Hang on a sec. Can you see anything on your screen? You can? Yeah, beautiful. All right. Um, now, in my little intro of myself, um, I spoke a little bit about um, culture and I'd just like to, you know, make it consistent for everyone so we follow in, in um, my, my presentation what culture actually means. So if you use a very um, easy description of culture if you just think about it as values norms and beliefs if you just anchor your your definition on that simple um, way of thinking about culture I'd like to introduce you to three forms of culture because culture is quite elusive and we, we speak about it so um, often and freely but um, we don't go into the depth of the different types of cultures that they are so I'm, I'm going to introduce you to three um, and, um, and, and see if you can identify it a little bit with yourself and, and figure out uh, as you're thinking um, how much of each culture you identify with. So the first one is your national um, or heritage culture. So this is likely the culture that you're um, born into and some of it carries a country culture. So if you were born in Singapore or born in the Philippines or born in South Africa, like I am, um, I have a, a cultural heritage that comes from growing up and living in South Africa, but I also carry with me my South Indian cultural heritage, 
which is also part of my culture. So it's, it's normally the one that you have um, grown up with and your parents have given you or your elders have given you. Um, and it, it's your predominant and first base or primary culture. And then comes probably with life experience and different journeys comes contextual or local culture. And this is the culture um, that is very much um, reticent with a student's journey. So you may have uh, been born in, lived and grown up in a home country culture. And then you come to Australia and you've got this local context or this current culture that you're in. And that actually um, sometimes might change your values, norms and beliefs. So if you remember the, the, the definition of culture being values, norms and beliefs, and it's, it would be interesting for you to think about how far you have moved in your values, norms and beliefs from your home country culture or the type of culture that your parents have given you or any sort of um, ethnicity, so religion or faith, how much of that has shifted in your journey here in Australia. It'll be different for everyone, right? But what I'd like to most focus on is our personal culture. So what emerges out of those base um, values, norms and beliefs is uh, a certain set of values, norms, and beliefs that are very unique to us. And it would be interesting for you if you have siblings or cousins that you grew up with or family members that know you from your home country and then um, people that may know you now. You know, how different are you in your personal culture? What are the things, the top one, two, three things that you hold very dear that you live your life by? What are those? And the personal culture that we share with others is often most closely aligned to our identity um, and who we are really. Uh, if you are living a very authentic kind of life, some of us are a little bit stuck between the three and we, it depends on who we are with. Um, so I can tell you when I'm with um, a whole lot of South Indian people, you'll see more of my identity that connects with South Indian people come out. And um, when I'm in a local culture of a business context, um, you'll see more of a focus in my uh, value set come out that's more focused on, on Australian business culture. And I really try and rationalize some of the things that I would normally operate in and I bring it up uh, to focus on, on my audience. So there's different cultures at play and there's different situations that bring out more or less of one. And the reason why it's stacked in circles like that is that it, it, it is a combination. Um, but what I find in myself um, as I've become more mature, um, so I, I probably think um, there's a big age difference on the call, I hope not, but I like to think of myself as young, but my son is going to go into VCE, so you can probably guess my age, I'm in my mid 40s, and now I'm more um, in sync with my personal culture, so I'm much more comfortable with my identity, I don't try to push down the South Indian or the South African background, I actually quite embrace my diversity, so I will um, use it in a conversation very freely and openly. But when I used to work for Optus about eight years ago, um, I probably was trying to walk the fine line between the organization culture that I was working in, the people that I was surrounded in, and, and my own identity and my personal values. So just work with that. It's not an easy thing uh, to sometimes rationalize in ourselves, but it should actually start you thinking of where do you drive from uh, and how clear is your personal culture to you? And now onto a, a little exercise, which I'd like to share with you. Um, and this is a cultural dimension model. So any of you studying psychology or um, intercultural relations uh, might identify with this model. Um, I'll just go down here. I might skip that. I don't know why that's not working with that slide, but, um, oh, we've got a question already. So Belle, do you want to hold questions? Uh, uh, or do you want to answer them as we go? What would you like? I think we will, yeah, so for all the attendees, just ask any questions that you want. We will try to answer all of them in the Q&A session. Okay, excellent. 
So um, I actually wanted this animation to work differently, but it hasn't worked the way I wanted it to. But I'll go ahead and explain what you see on screen is um, what you'll see on screen is what we call the nine dimensions of culture. And a dimension is, for example, on the first um, line that you see relationship on the left and task on your right. And harmony and control is another. So the dimension is a continuum. That's what it is. Um, it's just a, um, a preference of where people born in different countries or have lived and worked in different countries prefer to operate from. So that's the, the um, dimension chart that you see up there. And this is a theoretical model. Um, and what we've done in our business, so we lead a cross-cultural um, competence consultancy. And we work with um, large corporate clients uh, to understand their multicultural audience. So from a customer perspective or from an employee perspective. And we often run these um, early cultural diagnostics uh, when we are trying to understand a customer um, segment or when we're trying to understand different employee groups and how people come together. And you'll find that for migrant employees, so um, you know, let's fast forward yourself um, working in the workforce. So you, you graduated with your PhD and your or master's or whatever, and you're starting to work in Australian business culture. Here's what um, we often see is that um, there's a quite a difference between where migrant or international um, students or people come from in the way they operate. So I'll just explain a few um, of the dimensions and you probably can pick this up in questioning. For example, um, when you are in a, in a meeting environment, let's say you're meeting stakeholders for, a first time, for the first time on a project or an initiative, what you'll find generally is that um, the Australian business culture far more prefers to work from a task perspective. So if you read down the right hand side of the the dimension chart, you'll see words like task and control and individualism. And if you look on the left hand side of the chart, you'll see words like relationship, harmony, collectivism. And what you'll see is uh, a distinct difference from the drivers or the personal cultures that people come to different situations with. So in that meeting situation, you'll find that um, someone from an Eastern background would really look for more of the relationship focused. And you'll look for um, someone from an Australian background who will who look at the agenda, who will look at the uh, outcomes of the meeting, who will drive the discussion down that way. Um, and when you think about your home countries and, and potentially the way that communities kind of uh, connect, it's far more relationship-based as a preference. So we, 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 we like to understand who people are, where they come from, we're great storytellers, so we're interested in the narrative from people. So there's a distinct difference in the way um, we operate and what we need um, from situations. So that's, that's a dimension chart there, but it's, it's, um, it's easier to understand and we can share um, uh, some of these slides at the end to, for you to digest a little bit more. Each one has a descriptor, um, but e essentially they come from different places. Now, um, Rafaela, who's online, actually had a little bit of a poll um, to run with you, and I'd like to to work that through. And Rafaela, I wonder um, if you can skip that first question. Can you skip that first question, please? Because I kind of put up that line, which I didn't want you to put up. Well, I didn't want to put up. Um, so can you, um, can you think, um, everyone who's on, online, do you think people who are born in Japan are more hierarchy focused or more equality focused? And if you look, um, you know, on one of the dimensions, that's, that's one of the dimensions, hierarchy and equality. What would you say? If you can use your chat function and just let us know which one do you think Japan is, more hierarchy or more equality? And let us know. And I'll show you the result. And Rafaela, I think you might be able to aggregate that result for us and let us know. Right, okay, excellent, which you're absolutely correct. Um, 
So when we when we think about Japan, and I, I'm I'm wondering whether there's any Japanese people on online. Um, that would be interesting to know. Hang on one second. I'm just going to close the poll. Um, I've got too many things open. Okay. So here's Japan, right? And you're very right that Japan um, sits more on the hierarchy and um, very different from Australian um, style of, of wanting equality. And I, I like this dimension because I find it very interesting working with um, different teams with, dif with different multicultural backgrounds. And what I'd say is um, on, a, on, a, on an initial basis, uh, Australia loves to give or Australian people love to give the equality. So they like to think that everyone who comes into a meeting is pretty equal. But what's interesting is that um, Australia, uh, Australian born people are, are highly judgment orientated. So when they find that there's a um, difference between uh, competency levels or there's any sort of trust, what they um, do is they, they flip and they move more towards um, the hierarchical element. So it's a very interesting dimension to look at. So even though Japan will appear to be more hierarchical and more structured, uh, because there's definitely a boss in most situations and there's definitely a subordinate in most situations, um, Australia appears to not have that hierarchy on the surface, but actually um, when it comes to working for a long period of time with Australian teams, you find out that there is actually that um, subset of hierarchy it's just not very overt the um, open position in Australian teams is that everyone is equal but if you are not as equal as you thought you were in competence then we will actually pull rank and, uh, and, and assume more of a hierarchical or boss mentality so it's a very difficult one to, to, to play out um, but more so um, when you ask Australian people are you more hierarchical or less hierarchical they often tell us well we, we expect that there's equality, um, but it's interesting to find that that can flip the longer you work with people. So let's do the next poll, Rafaela. Let's look at um, uh, another country. So can we look at Singapore? Um, I'd love to know um, from you where you think Singapore is focused. Do you think Singapore is more harmony focused or more control focused? So if you look at that dimension, so how many is where we just want to reach consensus, we, we don't want there to be a winner or a loser, we prefer that everybody has, um, you know, feels comfortable in the conversation and, and, and nobody's feeling like there's, a, there's conflict. And in Australia, a lot of Australian teams um, coming from that task sort of focus, there's more focus on, on um, wanting a little bit of control in the conversation or control over the task or outcomes. Um, and they don't mind if there's a winner or a loser and they don't mind conflict. Um, so where do you think they fall? So this is Singapore. I hope this is some Singaporeans on the line and you can guess where you are. Okay, so when you're ready, Rafaela, um, let's, let's look at the poll. Right, so you think Singapore is more harmony focused. Very interesting. Now let me show you some differences and I'm gonna show you, so I'm gonna hold that in check. So if you can remember that um, the, the group thinks that Singapore is more harmony focused and less controlled. Um, let's look at a couple of other countries and then I'll introduce Singapore, right? So here's China. I find China very interesting. Um, so you'll find that China actually pretty much is very similar to Japan except for um, the religion uh, portion and and then pretty much follows the eastern sort of focus right and this is not hong kong this is china so if you're interested in where exactly here's india so i do know that there are quite a quite a few indian nationals on the call and um, india is very typical um, eastern focus high relationship high harmony um, high collectivism so they all sort of follow um, down the same kind of feeling and here's Singapore. So if you were on the call and you said, oh, Singapore is actually more harmony based, it actually isn't. Um, so Singapore is very interestingly dead smack in the middle of this culture dimension chart. 
And the reason I wanted to show you Singapore and, and why most people get it wrong, so don't feel badly that you, you, you got it wrong and there isn't really a right or wrong, but generally people misunderstand Singapore because they think it's an Eastern country and they should be like all Eastern countries all the way to the left and they high value of relationship and harmony and things like that. Highly collectivist, um, lots of community focused, um, more hierarchy. And Singapore isn't because Singapore um, actually has a, a high relation to the West because of its history and because of its financial capital and Western influence. Um, so it really has been exposed to the West a lot longer than most of the other uh, Eastern countries and therefore has changed some of its uh, business values, norms and beliefs. And is it's very tricky to understand Singaporeans because it depends on how much they identify with the East and how much they identify in the West. And the best way to go around it is to understand um, where they drive from. So you've got to really decode their values, norms and beliefs. So I'm very careful when I work with Singaporeans because I always try to understand whether they are more task focused in a, in a conversation or they're more relationship focused in a conversation. And I quickly navigate that early on in the first few minutes of the conversation and then try to drive from wherever they drive to get them engaged. So um, I want you to get from this chart that um, cross-cultural intelligence is very uh, is very rich and diverse and even if you sit in one of these countries in the east it doesn't mean that you always will um, sit with a high relationship focus or harmony focus these are cumulative graphs uh, over thousands and thousands of cultural diagnostic surveys but at the end of the day, people are people. And if you approach, for example, Singaporeans or Chinese people or Japanese people or Indian people with a judgment that they should be a certain way or behave a certain way, you probably likely are going to be wrong because you need to understand how they drive from their personal culture. So the, the last wheel that I showed you in the previous um, slide is what you need to, to assess people on not only the country cultures that they were born into or they are, are um, most, most identify with, it's, it's best to not judge before you connect with them. So I just wanted to show you that because it's very interesting, um, but also understand that there's a big difference generally with the East and the West. And you, and you need to understand that when you start working with Australian business culture, because um, while you can, um, you know, understand how you operate, you always need to compare it with um, the majority of people who are in the room. Appeal to that task and control, but also um, you know, drive from the high value set of relationship because even though Australia presents to be quite task and control focused, that is a first preference. Eventually, as the relationship grows, they will tend to want to understand who you are and what you bring. So it's not as if it's one or the other. It's actually a continuum. So don't forget that, that it's, it's not binary. Um, and I'll leave it there because um, there's probably likely some questions that we'll answer towards the end. But that's pretty much the, the gist of what I wanted to share with you um, today. And hopefully it's been helpful, or at least if you're leave it, left a little bit confused, this is a good thing because it means that you're questioning. So thanks, Belle. Thank you so much, Dee. Thank you for this presentation. This is so interesting. Okay, I might just get you to stop share. Yep. Great. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, that was very interesting. And I like that you also um, added the part that individual, as individuals, we are all very different. Um, it's quite important for us to understand um, how people from other culture value things, but it's equally as important that we do not judge anyone before we connect with them. So you're absolutely um, correct on that. And I like that. Um, it's so interesting you say that um, we are so malleable and adaptive towards uh, our environment as, I guess, foreigners in this country that we also um, kind of like, can we just change how we behave with different people? That's really interesting. Now I'd like to um, introduce Mecca to share um, her journey um, and experience so far and how um, cross-cultural intelligence and how um, her, what she brings um, uniquely to the table um, helps her. Mecca, welcome. 
Thanks, Mel. And um, yeah, Raf, thanks for sharing my slides as well. Um, if we can go on to, yeah, that's the, just the, yeah, well, let's start with the second slide. Um, I guess, yeah, as, as, as Belle said, I'm going to be sharing my journey in terms of how I came here, what I've learned, and, and, and also another aspect, and I echo Div's, um, uh, you know, the contribution to the conversation so far in terms of, you know, embracing your diversity and, and also knowing that culture is, is you know the cultural nuances they are very elusive they they are so they're very subtle and i guess um, my presentation or through my journey what i have learned is is that subtlety is is understanding those nuances in terms of uh, culture in terms of co communication in a diverse uh, environment excuse me <coughs> so as you can see um you know, this timeline pretty much tells me how old I am again, but I like to believe, as Div said, that we are all young at heart. So I came in here as uh, uh, in 2003, at the end of 2003, to start my journey here uh, into, uh, and started doing my master's. To be very honest, when I came here, it's, it's like now, what's almost 17 years ago, um, the world has changed, obviously, as we all know. Uh, and, and, and yeah, my understanding of the world uh, when I came in is pretty much in in um, context with what I had seen of what the Western world or what different cultures are through the exposure through TV and through some of the series that I used to watch or that were Western series. And that was what I thought that the whole sort of Australian culture is going to be about. Uh, and I come here and I experience things and realize that it is so much more. It is there is so much in depth, uh, you know, understanding of culture, or understanding of what it means to come from a different background, uh, come here and then you know sort of establish yourself or adapt yourself to that culture. Then, as I, um, you know, the journey sort of indicates, I started working here in um, a fairly uh, in an environment that I thought that I knew because I was studying at that university. I was uh, a part of that university community, quite an active part as well, because I was, you know, in, in terms of uh, my student life, I was the president of the uh, Indian Association over there for, I think, I, pretty much the entire time I was there as a student. So I thought that I understood the university environment very, fairly good. But then when I went into that whole work environment and, and as a colleague, what it meant, there was a shift. There was definitely an adapt adapting period that I had to be very careful about in terms of understanding where I was, what I needed to be doing, what I um, was expected to do and how to manage what I was doing, what I was expected to do with what I wanted to do. So, you know, there was a sort of a shift in terms of my thinking over there as well. Then in 2010, I decided to go back to India because, you know, I was here by myself and I'm pretty sure at some point all of us have felt that homesickness, that wanting to go back to your family. And uh, for me, I had been here for almost seven years uh, by myself because my entire family is still back home in India and I'm the only person who's away from them. So went back in India and I realized that, you know, even though I was born and brought up in that Indian culture, but there was a, an adaptation period that I needed to go through, uh, which was in reverse because, uh, you know, I had experienced another culture, another way of working, another way of lifestyle for seven years and uh, adapted that lifestyle to a certain extent in my own uh, personal uh, cultural space as well so i needed to go back and i needed to sort of uh, you know reverse that adaptation uh in terms of what it means to be back home with family be in that indian environment and start working in that indian environment and how is that different so that was a very interesting and a pivotal i guess shift in my understanding of what cross-cultural intelligence means it has you know, it took a different, uh, you know, dimension for me in terms of just because up till then I thought that, okay, it is, you have your culture, you have your understanding of it, and then you go into something new and then you need to understand. But I think it is 
what I realized in that shift was that it is not about understanding a historical culture, so to speak. I actually sort of term it as your uh, cultural environment as is, which keeps on changing. So my cultural environment as is changed when I went back to India because of all these shifts that had happened in my own um, headspace, in my own personal life, and in my own professional understanding of things. And then again, in 2014, I decided to come back to Australia, which was again sort of, a, um, I guess, an adaptation cycle that I went through. But I think because of my experience of going back home and going through that whole cycle, I think I was better prepared in my understanding of what needed to happen or what stages of adaptation I'm going to go through uh, in my second stint of coming into Australia and starting working here. And um, since I've been back, I've worked in the, in the international education space in primarily for government agencies and uh, use these experiences of um, cultural adaptation in and bring them into uh, the work that I'm doing into my professional life, into some of the projects that I'm handling, not only from the point of view that, okay, I come from South Asia, I bring in that expertise, but also from the point of view in terms of how I can be of value in bridging that gap that exists uh, between an Australian entity, whether it is an organization or a person or a team and the Indian entity, whether it is a client, my own organization or my own team. And that has been, I guess, one of the most um, personally and professionally enriching experiences for me uh, in, in this journey. Uh, I'll just sort of stop the personal journey bit over here, but I'll go to the next slide, Ra. Um, which is, uh, I wanted to share like out of this whole sort of 17 years of journey that I've just shared with you, I think for me, the three key uh, learnings or three key lessons or skills that I have felt have really helped me. And this is completely and totally based on my personal experience, not in it. And, um, based on any of the studies or any any kind of academic insight has been uh, uh, you know the three things that I've mentioned here, which is on observe, listen, and participate. And I have felt that, yes, considering the kind of global uh, situation that we are in, the global and the diverse uh, workspaces and communities that we are living in, these are the three things that I have felt give you that understanding of the nuance of culture and communication in a culturally diverse uh, society. So I definitely sort of think that these are the three uh, key points and they have been, if you can go to the next slide, they have been a key, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess in terms of my current work organization, which is uh, Australian Trade and Investment Commission. And I've just put the core values uh, of our organization up there. And I wanted to sort of share these values primarily because I wanted to showcase that as an organization that is working in this global situation, uh, how much, even though in cultural intelligence is not being mentioned, uh, you know, explicitly, but it is an underlying, you know, um, sentiment in in everything that we are doing at Austrade, whether it is sort of, you know, uh, or we're talking about our global network of Australians, or whether it is we're talking about our clients in Australia, or whether it is we're talking about our clients offshore. So that intercultural intelligence plays a key role in terms of our work that we are doing in terms of any of our achievements or any of our outcomes that we might be bringing in for the Australian um, society or Australian businesses. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, you know, one of the key learnings has been for me to participate because that's where, you know, you bring in your intelligence, you bring in your personal cultural values, and then you get a chance to observe and listen to other people's uh, cultural values and evaluate how or where 
you stand and how or where you can actually sort of uh, contribute in terms of the conversations that are, that are happening. And one of the ways that I thought probably considering the audience that we have today um, for uh, that audience to participate and to contribute that conversation is going to be an, a sentiment survey that uh, Austrade is currently doing. If you can go to the uh, next slide. Um, that's on uh, the student sentiment, the onshore student, the students that are currently here in Australia. What do they feel in terms of, um, you know, the, the responses that have happened on COVID-19, the kind of communication channels that they have used and how best we can actually improve those communication channels and get the communication or get the information right information um you know authenticated information to the students so that's i just wanted to put it out there uh, and i'm happy for bell and Raffaella to share these slides in terms of that survey that is uh, going to be open till 27th of Mar uh, july please do participate in that survey give because you know it's that information coming directly from you which i think is going to um you know um, help direct the conversations that we have in this space so I guess this is sort of a little bit of an overview of my journey of what I felt um, that I should be sharing in terms of my key learnings. And I hope that's, that's of help. Um, so I'll just stop there and leave it to Belle for if there are any questions. And I know we are running a bit late at this stage. Thank you, Mecca. Thank you very much for sharing. And Austrade is a very important stakeholder for international students here in Australia and a keen supporter of CESA. So we, we are always very happy to collaborate with um, Austrade for the betterment of international students. And thank you also for sharing some of your thoughts around um, why cultural intelligence is important and how we can improve them. And I'd like to also extend this um, question to Dave. What are some practical tools that the attendees today can take away to improve our cultural intelligence? Beautiful. Thanks, Belle, for that question. Um, I'm just going to share a little um, tool with you. And I'm, I'm not going to use my slide, Belle, because it's quite easy to understand. So if you're online and you have a piece of paper, I think the, the, the things that I'd like you to write down is a little behavioral model that's called feel, think, do. Um, and some of the practical ways, and I think Sean, you asked this question as well, which I was trying to busily type to you. So this, this is directly Sean's question, uh, which is great, is um, that how you, you practically adjust to learning about um, Australian business culture and operating in there and, and also managing the rich diversity that you have to offer in any um, conversation or project or interaction is really understanding your own diversity um, and identifying with that personal culture very strongly. And the way that you can do that is really um, understand whether you feel included and able to bring your diversity to the table. Um, what do you think about your own diversity? Um, because a lot of international students are always asking me the question about how do they adjust to Australian business culture? And I think sometimes loaded in that question is um, you trying too hard to adjust to Australian business culture and in somewhere along that journey kind of losing your own diversity um, and I think that's what you shouldn't do because we all know that um, diverse and ethnically diverse teams uh, from a business perspective actually contribute 35 percent more uh, financial performance to any um, cross-culturally different team so there's this there was a huge study done by McKinsey that showed 35 percent more financial improvement from um, cultural uh, and ethnicity being represented in senior leadership. So it's very interesting to know that statistic, but then when you look at um, multicultural people and migrants and refugees and international students and everybody who brings a different cultural heritage, if you don't um, feel and think that your diversity is valuable, then likely what you will do is not contribute that consciously to a project team or an environment. Um, and especially when I think about CISA and how it operates, if you're um, you know, in a leadership position, and I've watched Belle do this beautifully, where she actually values her diversity and she contributes it every time. 
uh, with with also acknowledging that the environment that she's in. So I've watched her on Austrade meetings and interacting with senior stakeholders, and I can see that balancing act, which is beautiful to watch. But that that's probably because um, Bell is feeling and thinking that her diversity is valuable, and she's acting on it. So I'd love to uh, you to practice that feel think do. Um, from your own perspective first and then also from understanding and watching and observing so very uh, very much to Mega's points of um, I can't remember the exact uh, three things Mega but you had you know observation in there reflection in there and that's so important um, so think about that um, about that feel thing do model uh, with yourself and with others thank you so much Steve and it means so much to me that you use me as a positive example. Wow. <laughs> I, I feel like I, many international students would have the same, I guess, experience that I do that it definitely took me a long time. Initially, um, there is a lot of conflict when inner conflict uh, with the culture shock that um, when you behave in a way that um, is not usually what they do in an Australian um, environment and you try very hard to adapt to their, um, their way of doing things and then at some point you need to come back and think about this is my uniqueness and this is what I can bring to the table that other people don't and you, it takes time and effort to learn to value those things as well. Thank you so much Dee. You're a very good example Bill. <laughs> oh, thank you. So I'd like to open it up to um, uh, I also see that Deep had taken the time to um, type out the answers um, to some of the questions that the audience had. So before we close um, the session, I would also like to open up to uh, maybe one more opportunity for a Q&A. If any attendees have any questions, we would like to try to answer them. Um, Juliet says that the think, feel, do model reminds Juliet of empathy map design tool. Yes, yes. So it comes from a human centric design principle. Um, and you're very right, Juliet. You are correct. It, it is empathy mapping. And I think that an important part of um, cultural intelligence is to be aware of the uh, what we've conditioned into thinking about stereotypes, even though it's um, important to understand, but also to be aware of when we judge because it's normal for people to judge. That's how we um, try to make sense of things. But it's important to um, be aware of it and pull back on it and say, no, we are not going to judge. We are going to um, think, feel and do better. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, a lot of that judgment and bias can actually sit in that feel and think. And that's how we act towards others. So we go, oh, you know, um, certain groups of people are like this um, because that's how Asian people are, for example. And then we go, that's it. We've just made a judgment and that's who they are. And, and now I act differently towards them. But you don't actually understand that um, you have to connect with people from a feeling and thinking perspective. And the best way to do it is by directly asking people how they feel and what they think and then judge them on that. Don't judge them on your perception of small interactions with people. It's just not right. Uh, and you wouldn't like it to, towards yourself either. So why would you do that to somebody else? So I think that's an inclusion perspective. Um, mm, yes, that's, that's really important that we want to encourage diversity, but even more important is the inclusion of everyone in an organization. So um, the... Um, Belle, can I just add to this as well? I mean, as I mentioned, you know, uh, observe and listen. I think that that becomes an important, these, these soft skills become really important in, in that whole cultural space of uh, uh, a DIVS model as well. Because if you, what I have learned in all the seminars and every uh, sort of personal or professional development workshop that I've attended is that when you're listening is when you're actually learning something new. So, you know, if, if all you're doing is just talking, you're just repeating what you already know. So it's very important to have these two sort of, they might, may not be, you know, very explicit skills to have in your uh, resume or in your repertoire, but these are very important uh, power skills that, that are going to, you know, 
help you develop those important skills that you're probably going to end up putting in your resume. So it's very important to have those two. And some people sort of confuse that, okay, if you're, uh, you know, if you're listening, you're observing, but I think there is a very clear distinction in observation and in actually listening to what is happening around you. So it's, yeah, again, my stress on those two sort of skills in that, in the perspective of the model that has been presented here today. Thank you. Thank you for the addition, Mecca. Um, it's definitely a skill that all of us should and need to continue developing, um, listening uh, with, with intention. So thank you everyone, all the attendees that are listening to our speakers today. <laughs> and thank you, Deep and Mecca again for your time. It's been a wonderful session and I'm, I'm really hopeful for all of our attendees and international students today um, will incorporate these skills into um, their journey in becoming a leader of tomorrow. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Mega. Same, yeah. Talk soon. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.